Thank you, Lily. Um, well, it's not war on you and conflict with you. It's <laughs> um, first of all, I would I would like to uh, thank very much Lily and the New School for allowing us to meet once again and to organize uh, uh, and to discuss this project. Um, uh, I think that Lily and her team, all the assistants, Law and all the assistants have been doing a great job. So I'm really grateful to you for this and for bringing this public, this audience and the discussant. So I think that this will be certainly uh, uh, very important for the development and the conclusion of our project. So thank you very much for doing this. Um, I, as Lily said in her uh, brief introduction, uh, my chapter is about uh, war and conflict. Um, I, I need to put this into a context when this is about uh, an IR textbook and this is what we are trying to do here. So when I thought initially about this chapter, I was thinking what needs to be said to, the, to our audience, what needs to be uh, uh, taught to our students and can we really do it differently? What does it mean to be doing this in our part of the world, be it in Brazil, in Morocco, Colombia, South Africa, India, so or Turkey that, that is absent today with us. <laughs> so uh, what does it mean to be teaching these concepts in these different settings uh, and in these different places? Um, so uh, I will follow here the... Um, the, the organization that we agreed on uh, a few months ago. So I will be, in the first part of my discussion is uh, what I called all you must know about war and conflict. <laughs> the second part is about the encounter and the third part is uh, are the alternatives. Um, so all you must know about war and conflict. Um, I start in my, I, I want also to apologize to you for the very, very late submission of the paper. Um, we were joking over lunch and saying that it was fresh in your mind and you did it on purpose, but that was certainly not the purpose. Um, so, um, the, uh, the way I put it uh, in writing is to, I start, so all you must know, what should our students know about war? Uh, I, I think that we need to start with Thucydides, and I start with Thucydides. Uh, what do we learn from Thucydides? Well, how he has been used by traditional IR scholars uh, in order to explain change, and change that comes through war. So uh, we have several concepts in Thucydides that need to be, uh, that we need to discuss, and that we have been carrying on with us in, in understanding war and in dealing with war, and that come to us from Thucydides. So, uh, and the, the central concept here is the concept of change. I go uh, from there to the concept of just war because it has been also uh, used in several moments over the last 10 centuries in order to justify uh, wars, waging wars, for what purposes, under what conditions. And most recently, the concept of just war has been used uh, by many scholars in order to discuss uh, humanitarian interventions. So the concept of just war is, I believe, one of these key concepts that exist in I, uh, that the, one of those key uh, ways in which we use war in IR, and I think that it needs to be discussed with our students. The next stop is Clausewitz and uh, the influence of Clausewitz in uh, uh, allowing us to understand war. And I think that what Clausewitz, one of the major inputs of Clausewitz is that he made discussing war a state-centered issue. We started have, dealing with war as uh, a phenomenon of the state and the legitimacy of war is, uh, is a result of the state. So how the role the state plays in, uh, in war became evident and became, or 
it uh, Im was imposed by the approach of Clausewitz to the concept of war. And then, um, inevitably, uh, uh, I progressed uh, towards uh, the uh, behavioralist uh, revolution in the 1950s and 60s here in social sciences, and uh, it was which was translated for us in international relations through the Correlate of War project and the how that uh, established definitely in the field of international relations war as a state phenomenon. And we define state, uh, war as an interstate war. We, and in those statistical series, there is no mention of intrastate wars. There is no mention of, uh, um, of civil wars, of independence wars. So all of this is totally absent from that body uh, represented, that uh, accumulation of knowledge represented by the Correlate of War project. And I think that, uh, but this is one of the major contributions to the debate that was taking place in, uh, in social sciences. Uh, um, so uh, the, the second part is uh, a little bit more interesting and a little bit more uh, attractive to us. It's uh, what we called uh, in our approach the encounter. So uh, and the multiple encounters that exist in international relations between this this traditional concept of war and uh, its. Uh, inability to explain or to deal with some of the situations that exist in this global south. Um, and the first of these uh, situations is uh, the uh, wars of independence or decolonization wars. Uh, most independence movements were deemed as illegal movements. Most independence movements and most independ and independence movements and their struggle for independence were considered as terrorist movements because they were using illegally uh, violence uh, in order to reach their objectives. Uh, and this was the case uh, in Asia as well as in Africa, which makes, uh, which makes the traditional concept of war, which makes us wonder uh, about this traditional concept of war. Is, if war is only between two states, and but if there is an inherent injustice taking place, it's the, coloniz uh, the colonization of one, uh, of one territory and one people by uh, an existing state, how could these uh, people struggle towards independence? How could they uh, emancipate themselves from colonization? This is the key question that the traditional concept of uh, war or the traditional understanding of war did not uh, would not allow us to understand, and I think that this is a failure in this encounter between uh, uh, the uh, traditional concept of war and our global south. The second um, failure is um, uh, the intrastate wars or um, those wars that uh, uh, the, the, the number uh, the number and here I'm I'm talking about. The the concepts, uh, uh, the, the study of uh, Holsty and uh, the fact that there is uh, a, a growth in the number of intrastate wars and that in the post Second World War period, what we have been witnessing are more and more intrastate wars and less and less interstate wars, which made the phenomenon of war a, uh, an, uh, uh, a very de- uh, we decentered the state from that phenomenon of war, and we started talking about these non-state actors and these non-state conflict uh, within state conflicts and within state wars. Um, and this is uh, one of the major ways through which war was developed in the in in Africa. If we look at the wars in Africa, and to the exception uh, or to two no, very notable exceptions, and it was the Ethiopian invasion of Somalia and then the Western Sahara issue, all the other wars that took place in Africa, none of these wars took place in order to uh, expand borders, uh, question borders, or uh, all these wars. And so all the wars took place within the context of, of the states. There were inter intrastate wars. And the contribution of external powers, regional powers, was exclusively to support one or 
the other side of those intrastate wars. So uh, this is another issue with which we cannot, uh, the, the traditional concepts could not help us understand what was taking place there. The third issue, uh, kind of issues that um, uh, uh, I mentioned in my paper are the what have been has been called humanitarian interventions, and uh, it is somehow a consequence of the democratic peace theory, an indirect consequence of the democratic peace theory. Michael Doyle was became one of the fervent supporters of uh, this um, uh, of, in, uh, human, of interventions in order to expand democracy to all, uh, around the world and in the Arab world in particular. Uh, but these humanitarian interventions and the concept of humanitarian interventions is also uh, an, a concept that is established uh, by academia, but uh, that is highly question, questionable and questioned uh, because of how it impacts and how it has evolved in the context of uh, the, of the what we call here the global south. The fourth and last uh, um, issue is uh, the, what was called also some 12 years ago the war on terror and the, oh, the terrorism and the threat that terrorism uh, was deemed to, was considered to be representing in international affairs. Um, and the problem here is that uh, a specific political event that took place in the United States uh, became a global threat and everyone around the world had to consider uh, the, the ter terrorism as a global threat and to mobilize all the, all the capabilities in order to deal with terrorism as a global threat. So how does, how does uh, uh, war on terrorism uh, uh, impact uh, states in the global south uh, that, uh, uh, and how uh, this war on terrorism ended up having an impact not only on the states in this global south, but also on uh, uh, sub-state actors, mainly on a major, uh, major, it became a major threat to human rights, to democratization, to refugee rights. Uh, so all these, uh, uh, some of the issues that had been settled somehow in the debate became threatened because of the, 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 the declaration 12 years ago of that war on terrorism. So uh, this is, the, these are the failures of the traditional uh, literature on war that I consider in my chapter. Um, what are the alternatives? And uh, here uh, it's... Um, the first thing I need to say here is that this is certainly the part of the chapter that uh, is less developed uh, uh, and I, I need to develop it further. Uh, uh, and I am ready to take note of suggestions uh, and of ideas about how to deal with this. The second thing I want to say here is that when we look for alternatives, it's, um, it's essential to um, uh, to question somehow, and I'm looking here at Arlene, our concept and uh, about um, the global south, because some of the pro essential problematiz problematizations of the concept of four come to us not from uh, the global, from this geographical global south, and I think that this uh, enhances the risks of geographically defining where the alternative comes from and how we need to look for the alternative exclusively in geographical terms. So I think that this is uh, because I explore some of the colleagues uh, that have the, that we uh, all of us know and that who have been problematizing the concept of for in uh, from the critical side uh, uh, and that who have been doing some very uh, producing some very interesting work so we should not be looking exclusively for alternatives in the geographical south we need uh, I assume that we I think that we need to be looking at alternatives in different uh, uh, within academia and how we can think differently about the concept of war and not only uh, from a geographical point of view. Um, the, uh, um, the second, uh, uh, so uh, 
The alternative approaches that I see uh, to the phenomenon of war is something that uh, took place, uh, I start with uh, something that took place in the 1950s and essentially 1960s and somehow even in the 1970s in Latin America that were the guerrilla, guerrilla wars and that were considered uh, as uh, movements of uh, emancipation, uh, struggles of uh, specific groups against uh, uh, repressive regimes, against authoritarian regimes, and how these regimes uh, used violence. So the use of violence not only by those who rebelled and revolted against the regimes, but also by the regimes in order to repress those, uh, those movements. So I think that there is a, a, a very uh, fascinating and very interesting uh, literature in that, to that respect that I could not explore fully here for this uh, for this chapter, but that needs to be explored. And I I know how to look for it. I just didn't have time to explore it more. Uh, the two other scholars I I, I approached here are uh, uh, from the region where I come from, and the, this was something we agreed on uh, a few months ago when we first discussed uh, how we should be looking for these alternatives. The first one. Uh, from a historical perspective is Ave Royce and uh, his contribution to understand to uh, the definition of what war is. Um, and here I have to admit that I um, all the admiration that I have for um, uh, for uh, uh, the debate between Ave Royce and Imam Ghazali about the use of reason in, uh, in Islam uh, somehow evaporated when I explored the writings of Ave Royce about war because what Ave Royce tells us about war is basically that it's uh, how, uh, what a friend calls the Muslim or the Islam version of uh, just war theory. So how war should be waged, under what conditions, when is war just, and uh, uh, under what conditions. So how we should wage war in order to uh, re uh, make it just, and so on and so forth. And when we do the parallel between, uh, between the Christian and the Muslim just war theory, there are basically just no differences. So it is disappointing uh, and we need to look for alternatives elsewhere. I think that one of uh, the, the interesting alternatives is certainly uh, in Ibn Khaldun and how he, uh, how he uses war uh, and his understanding of war as a concept that war for Ibn Khaldun transformed Arabs from barbarians into a civilizing population. Islam did it for Arabs, so Arabs were a bunch of barbarians, and they needed Islam, and the conquest of Islam allowed Arabs to do that transformation and to become uh, vectors of civilization instead of uh, being vectors of, um, bar bar uh, of barbary. So, this is uh, this is uh, uh, these are only two or three words. Uh, these are only very few words in order to refer to uh, Ibn Khaldun here. So what Ibn Khaldun says in essence is that um, uh, what war allows uh, has it, uh, what war allowed Arabs to do is uh, after they became Muslim, uh, after they became Muslim, is to explore uh, to expand geographically, but expand bringing uh, a message and bringing a civilizing message, bringing a positive message. Uh, so, and it is, but according to Ibn Khaldun, war is only the first movement in expanding this, civil, civil, this Muslim civilization because war cannot be complete without, uh, uh, because the expansion cannot be complete without uh, uh, the um, uh, establishing 
establishing uh, uh, a civilization, a Muslim civilization that goes through different vectors and different uh, components, uh, culture, and uh, here he uses his concept of asabiyah. So uh, the, the concept of asabiyah that allows the Muslims to rule and to rule efficiently and to perpetuate their rules, uh, uh, to perpetuate their political rules. So war is just uh, the first moment in expanding the, 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 the good word or the word of Islam. And after that, you need Asabiya, uh, you need politics in order to perpetuate that. So it's not war uh, uh, as a uh, uh, continuation of politics, it's war as something that opens the field for politics. And I think that this is something that uh, this is a perspective that is different and that is pre uh, presented by um, by Ibn Khaldun. So, uh, in a, in a conclusion, I would say that um, this is one of the cha those chapters in this textbook that in which we need really to uh, to be careful. Is this is there really an, an alternative and a different, completely different way of thinking about these concepts when one deals with them from this global south? War um, war can be waged without the state, and I try to explore this here and to discuss this here, but war has been an essentially state phenomenon. So when we think about war, and if we want to, th uh, to find out about alternatives, we need necessarily to uh, let the state apart and explore different uh, uh, different literatures and different ways of understanding this phenomenon in order to bring this complexity. So I think that there are alternatives, but we still need to look for them. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for a uh, very thought-provoking paper. Uh, it's, I think it's very ambitious to try and cover and survey this landscape of war and conflict in 20 pages is, is, is really a tall order and should be applauded for, if nothing else, taking on that tall order. Um, so from part of a conversation we even had over lunch, uh, I guess what I saw how I could sort of contribute to this conversation is think aloud f with you uh, about some of the ways I've been thinking about war and some of the reactions I had about your thoughts. Um, and, you know, being this is the new school, this is sort of the perfect venue to talk about how we think about things, you know. Um, epistemology is ontology as far as we're concerned here at the new school. How we think about things really does inform how the world works. And, um, when I started to think about what sort of conceptual frameworks were sort of useful, um, I mean, there's just such a vast amount of literature, it's hard to almost know where to start, but I think uh, building off some of the things you said, you know, I think the whole Thucydides, Clausewitz foundation is really very strong, and this whole sort of famous uh, aphorism of Clausewitz is, is war is the continuation of politics, I think is actually a good place to start because you know, some actually people debate about uh, sort of mistranslations. My scholarly German is abysmal, so I couldn't really comment on that directly. But some people say that he was really saying that war is the continuation of policy and specifically centering it in states. So I think you're on strong footing in that regard. Um, but I would really here supplement it very much with um, some of the work of uh, obviously Weber's whole idea about how states have monopolized war. But I think really uh, to build on this, you have to pick up some of the threads of uh, another uh, former New Schooler, Charles Tilley, and his famous aphorism of how states made war and wars made states. Because that con connection to political order I think is really seminal in generating much of the field that we not just look at um, what the outcomes of war are, but who the actual actors are. And that takes us into the whole realm of organizations. And from there, we can also sort of take this Clausewitz notion about what war is the continuation of. And here, uh, actually, I want to borrow more from almost a Marxist tradition, 
uh, political economy, and there is a whole school of thought that basically says, war is the continuation of economics by other means. Um, I think that, that phrase was uh, sort of re-coined by a guy, David Keene, who's written a lot on uh, political economies of war. And why that's helpful for us, um, I think there's sort of at two levels. There's obviously sort of the economic interests in wars that are associated with states. And here we could even look at you know, uh, Eisenhower's famous farewell speech where he said, you have to really be careful of the military industrial complex because how they're going to drive this is going to be essential. But I want to pick up on sort of the general premise of the configuration of war and violence. And here, um, I'm stepping out a little bit uh, on a limb, but I, I think there's some sort of correlation here going on in the inside-outside realm. And see, see if this makes some sense to you. There's an inside-out version of how economies affect how force is projected. Historically, states have always mostly taxed their populations internally, you know, doing income uh, taxes, et cetera, in order to fund the projection of war abroad. But what's so interesting about the civil wars that we see is how states uh, and other actors have been taxing and gaining economic resources, right? They don't go to the population and do income tax. What they do is they tax at the border customs because you know, uh, natural resources are being exported and that's how they get most of their revenues. This is the phenomenon of the rentier state. Now, when they earn those revenues, where do they project force? Internally. So as opposed to the conventional inside-out model of internal economics funding outside projections of war, I think part of the change going on here is that we have taxing resources going out in order to fund internal wars, counterinsurgency. So there's probably something very fruitful there in pursuing um, economic aspects. This also leads to the whole literature that's been popularized in the 1990s known as the greed versus grievance literature about whether or not economic agendas in war are really what are as decisive. Um, there's been a lot of research about how um, there are very vested economic interests in the perpetuation of war, even if they aren't necessarily soldiers, um, scarcity in grain markets, uh, people who profiteer in a variety of ways. And I think that's a, a rich area of looking at in terms of um, how wars are presently structured. The third sort of version of this, besides continuation of politics and continuation of economics, is one I think that's very central to what we're all concerned about, and that is, in some ways, the war, war as a continuation of culture. And um, this may seem sort of alien to the West, because we tend to think of the West as being so rooted in this state-centric tradition. But there are all sorts of things you could look at as war as having very ideational components to it that we should think about. Uh, I was thinking about the sort of post-World War II period, the whole Cold War, the term itself, Cold War, has a very strong political connotation to it. It implies not just stability, but also that somehow we are buffered from the violence of war. But you ask anybody who's from the place where proxy wars were fought in the Cold War, it wasn't very cold at all. It was actually quite hot. Um, and there's all sorts of vocabulary associated with this. Um, this the so-called secret bombing of Cambodia, which was by no means secret to the people on the ground who were experiencing it. So I think this type of war and culture dimension is certainly helpful for us. There's also a burgeoning literature, um, I think mostly pioneered by uh, Christopher Coker and some of the others who talk about the difference of framing of war as instrumental versus existential. Uh, and most people tend to suggest that the West has a very instrumental version of war. Our, our goal is to win the war. Uh, we don't necessarily think of um, how the process of fighting wars may be central to our own identities. And this may be actually the root of our misunderstanding of what's going on in a place like Afghanistan, um, where being part of a warrior society in some ways can be enriching to one's identity. Here in the West, um, we perhaps miss out on that. In fact, we've consciously tried to separate ourselves from the cost of war and that warrior culture. Uh, people talk about how 
the drone warriors uh, in Nevada. You know, they basically punch a clock, they show up in the morning, they fly their drone, they go home at night to their families, and they're very intentionally distanced from the war. And that's great for American politicians because they don't have to worry about flag-draped caskets coming back. But in other ways, that separates us from experiencing the sacrifices of war and maybe makes us less reticent to object to when our politicians declare war. Um, so the whole political culture of war is another element that I think you could more greatly elaborate on and really strengthen. I think you can pull out these sort of politics, culture, and economic frames and think about how they configure. And I think some of the themes you discuss in the paper are perfect venues to do this. The war on terrorism uh, is a good one. Uh, humanitarian intervention is another. Um, piracy could be a third possibility. Um, let's, let's just take one of them for, uh, to start with. Um, terrorism, the whole war on terrorism phenomenon, I think is a good one because, first of all, the whole US response to 9-11 very much shows how we were in this previous uh, reality of what war was about. You know, uh, sometimes I, I talk about political archaeology to really understand what's going on. You have to look backwards to understand what's presently uh, root. When the World Trade Center was destroyed, the response of the US was to go to war against basically the government of Afghanistan. They really didn't have a whole blueprint of how you combat a transnational organization. So we were completely lost. We were completely blinded to a large extent. Yes, we were very good at ousting the Taliban, but then we didn't really have any understanding of how the conflict would then unfold. Part of this whole war on terrorism also comes with the language um, that is also uh, very much geared towards war understanding as an po entirely political phenomenon as we've characterized it. Um, the term uh, we were talking about over lunch, unlawful combatants. Somehow you have to have certain legal standing, law being something that a state has recognized in order to distinguish these types of combatants. That has very strong political connotations and I think fits perfectly with the premise of your analysis of war as a political phenomenon. Um, since I'm starting to run out of time, let me um, end with a couple of observations and things that maybe you can also help me with that I'm struggling with. Um, and the big one is this whole question of change, causality. What causes changes in cultures of war and understandings of security? And I think part of why that is such a challenging question is you have to think about where that culture is embedded. And we have different sorts of layers where this takes place. There is a whole government layer. There is a layer within military organizations themselves. And lastly, uh, the layer that gets most neglected always in conflict, and that is of victims themselves, civilians often. How they're thinking about war is often completely lost. Um, the whole issue of humanitarian intervention is actually another good crossroads to talk about the, mesh, the blending of these three things because um, one thing that uh, even the most ardent critics of humanitarian intervention always struggles with is there are very few surveys done of victims of war. Um, the most recent one was actually almost now a decade old. It was something done by the Red Cross. It was called the People in War Project and they surveyed victims of war, and they said, well, what do you think about you know, intervention? And they basically said, well, the more the better, because they're experiencing the problem on the ground. They just want to end the war. And that may in some way be limited view for us you know, sitting here comfortably back at the new school, um, but we have to somehow figure out how to reconcile the imperatives of war for people on the ground experiencing its worst uh, Im impacts. Um, I guess the final thing uh, I just want to mention is some irony here, that the non-Western way of war, um, although, although actors in the non-West may not be winning the war in some ways, uh, war itself, that they're, they're still being oppressed by imperialist powers, in some ways the whole counter-hegemonic idea of non-Western ways of war is being victorious in the sense that 
even here in the West, we are reshaping our ideas of war based on those views in the non-West. The best illustration of this is the whole rise of private military and security contractors, right? Because this really is the non-Western way of war. States don't like these things, but if you can't beat them, join them. Who are the, who are the biggest users of private security contractors? Governments, by far. So um, the, the sort of struggle for ideas in security studies, there is this material level it's being played out at, how wars are actually being fought by governments. But at the ide ideational level, what's going on and being taught in military colleges, um, ironically enough, is very much emulating the non-Western way. And I think that's an irony that the West can't escape, do doesn't matter how many bombers, submarines, or battleships they build. So I think I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, I'm going to start uh, apologizing to Eugenia. I only sent her an outline, um, and it's, I'm going to change completely what I'm going to say. Um, so it's going to be quite difficult for her to make any sense of what I'm going to do. Um, I, I did this because I, I've had a hard time thinking about how to write a textbook chapter that's different um, when thinking about foreign policy. Um, I change the title, actually. I don't know if it's the appropriate one, but today it's, the chapter would be called Foreign Policy in the Global South, Post-Coloniality or Politics as Usual? Question mark. Um, and I, I wanted to just start off by, by saying that uh, of all the sub-areas of international relations, foreign policy analysis to me seems by far the most conventional. Um, and I think this poses a, a true problem um, when trying to think differently from the Global South about foreign policy. Um, I say this having um, taught this semester at the graduate level a course on foreign policy analysis, um, which has basically reaffirmed this, this suspicion that I have. Um, unlike uh, international relations theory, which I also work on, where d distinct post-positivist um, and reflexivist lenses such as feminism, post-structuralism, post-colonialism have been put to use to, 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 to decenter thinking about world politics. Foreign policy analysis, quite surprisingly, has been largely off the, this critical radar. Um, and, and, and I would want to start off asking why. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons is that um, the, the practical and applied realm of foreign policy um, largely um, largely restricted to the actions of states um, in pursuit of their national interests, um, acts um, as, as a sort of blinder to thinking distinctly about um, this realm of international relations. Um, and although post-positivism has, has offered a more nuanced analysis of the state, um, I'm thinking here of Roxanne Lynn Doty's um, famous article of 1993, there hasn't been much else after that. Um, that explores identity um, and the ways in which state identity is, is constituted through social processes and how this impacts upon foreign policy. Um, the types of how questions that post-positivists post um, lends themselves to hasn't, um, haven't been employed to trace critically the, the how of state centrism and statism in foreign policy analysis itself, that is, um, an author such as Roxanne Lindori asks about state identity, but she doesn't actually put into question the idea that the state um, is the key actor of, of foreign policy. Um, and I would say that the Global South, um, both in terms of thinking that's been done and, and praxis, has been equally uncritical of this status quo. Um, analysts of, of foreign policy create knowledge um, in the Global South uh, largely designed to inform the policymaking process independently of whether or not this thinking influences policy, which it doesn't to a large extent, um, and, and are largely attuned to state needs. That is, knowledge is created with the idea of providing um, formula and, and ideas susceptible to being translated into to, to foreign policy in an applied sense. Um, even though the state doesn't pay much attention to this. And, and, and in this way, I think the policy, um, I think the foreign policy thinking itself seems to confirm um, Kenneth Waltz's portrayal of states uh, as like units in the international system. Um, 
that, that basically want the same types of things um, when conducting foreign policy. Um, and this to me poses a huge irony, which I have yet to, to resolve. And, and the irony is that this book that we are working on collectively is premised precisely on the idea that thinking about world politics um, from the perspectives of the non-West or the Global South is fundamentally different. Um, so if the Global South foreign policy is pretty much the same as the North, um, I think this is a real problem, um, especially when, when analyzing foreign policy, which is, which is what I'm trying to do. Um, so I wanted to start off basically saying that. Um, I also wanted to mention that, um, I think Nisar said this in his presentation, or, or it was Joao, um, speaking of, speaking of, um, Speaking of um, the foreign policy of the global south in singular, I think is also to grossly simplify the tremendous political, economic, historical, social, and cultural diversity that characterizes this majority block of states. Um, and yet, I, I would argue, and it's what I'm trying to think through, that in many ways the general logics that characterize foreign policies of the global south seem actually quite different from those of northern or developed states. Um, and here I think of um, statements such as that of Thucydides of over 2,000 years ago, the strong do what they will while the weak do what they must, um, seems to be a constant reminder um, that the countries of the Global South uh, occupy a distinct and, and according to some less important if not inferior role um, in the international system. Um, to wit, in the words of Waltz, again, uh, the founder of neorealism, uh, I love stating, I state this quote quite often, it would be ridiculous to construct a theory of international politics based on Malaysia and Costa Rica, largely because Malaysia and Costa Rica are irrelevant, in Waltz's opinion, to key dynamics such as the balance of power. Um, and on a domestic level, too, one could argue that variations in factors such as national development, state consolidation levels, and the role occupied by different countries in the international division of labor also impact on foreign policy in different ways. Um, more significantly, perhaps, than this, the countries of the Global South um, share a common experience with colonialism and imperialism um, that's often been manifested in their foreign policy practices. Um, and this is something that I'll, that I'll bring up in the third part of alternatives. Um, precisely the 1955 Bandung Conference, the Non-Aligned Movement, and the, the movement for a new inter international economic order in the 1970s um, constitute just three examples of what we could call collective actions uh, by the global south as in singular form designed to eliminate inequality and justice and to reaffirm the integrity of, of post-colonial states as sovereign subjects. Um, individually too, I would argue that um, the objectives of the global south, such as autonomy, which is something that I work on a lot in the Latin American context, have been at the core of, of foreign policy thinking and practice in many parts of the global south. Um, therefore, the idea that I'm trying to work on is, is that maybe um, beyond this politics as usual, um, Global South foreign policies might be read as an attempt to build post-colonial identities rather than the simple pursuit of the national interest um, defined by conventional um, theories of foreign policy. Um, I haven't written the chapter. I've thought through, though, based upon the three um, divisions that we've established and, and, and this conference gives me the opportunity um, to try to, to state them um, publicly and see what you think about how uh, I've thought about um, reorganizing my, my chapter. Um, the first section is identification of the problem. Um, and this would be just a standard restatement of different theories and, and conceptual models of foreign policy. Um, and basically what one could say when looking at them is that definitions and analytical models of foreign policy as um, IR theory itself uh, are linked to modern Western and Northern experiences with the international, um, pretty much ignoring the, the international experiences Global South. Um, I've listed a bunch of definitions of foreign policy in the outline that I gave to Eugenia. I just wanted to name perhaps two or three. Um, Morgenthau is perhaps one of the first authors to define foreign policy in these, in these um, widely accepted conventional terms as the state pursuit of the national interest defined in terms of power. And I think the three key concepts here are state, 
national interest and power. That is, it's assumed that foreign policy is conducted by states um, in pursuit of national interest defined in terms of power or, or, or that make use of power as a means to defend the national interest, um, which lends itself to an instrumental idea of, of what, it, what it is that states do and what it is that they pursue um, when they act in, in foreign policy. Um, another definition that I took from this um, widely used textbook on foreign policy, um, uh, co-edited by Smith, uh, Hadfield, and Dunn, uh, is the strategy or approach chosen by the, by the national government to achieve its goals and its relations with external entities. So there again, we have you know, the centrality of the government. Um, another definition, a complex multi-layered process consisting of the objectives that governments pursue in their relations with other governments and their choice of means to attain these objectives. Um, so basically what I want to show is that the state or governments are always the key actors. Um, and even when we look at post-positive post-positivist analyses of foreign policy, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, a definition by, by David Campbell. Um, foreign policy uh, is the practices by which the boundaries of a state's identity are secured by the representation of danger, difference, and otherness. Um, the constant articulation of danger through foreign policy is not a threat to a state's identity or existence. It is its condition of possibility. That is, uh, Campbell, um, in his analysis of, of US foreign policy, looks to foreign policy as the main strategy through which um, the United States secures its identity vis-a-vis -vis, uh, dangerous others um, abroad. So basically, that's what we have in terms of the existing literature, um, in, in terms of definitions of foreign policy. Um, and when we look at, and I'm not going to go into analytical models, which I find quite boring, quite honestly, even though I have to teach um, foreign policy analysis, the great majority of analytical models that discuss foreign policy are rooted in, in the levels of analysis debate. That is, they, they focus on systemic factors, state and society factors, or individual factors, and then um, part from there in terms of analyzing uh, foreign policy. Um, I just wanted to uh, mention one that perhaps uh, provides an umbrella for all of this literature, which is James Rosenau's, um, I think it's in the 1960s, uh, his pre-theory of foreign policy. Basically, where, where what he tries to do is establish a, a means of, of developing causal analysis of foreign policy based upon the differing weights of systemic state level and what he calls idiosyncratic or individual level factors. Um, and what he does is tie these to uh, the size and strength of a country, its relative levels of development, um, its economy, and the open or closed nature of its political system. Um, this is something that's been used, um, at least in Latin America, and I would, I would suspect in the Global South in general, to think about um, the foreign policies of, of smaller countries. Basically, what Rosenau's model suggests is that in small, underdeveloped countries with open or closed political systems, and, and what he calls penetrated systems, that is the intervention of foreign actors, one would expect they're both international level, um, international system level factors and individual factors are idiosyncratic, meaning, for instance, um, the personal whims of a president um, are the most important in explaining foreign policy behavior. Um, so this section, as Nisar said in his presentation, is probably going to be not very stimulating in terms of reviewing the existing literature because, as I said at the beginning, the existing literature really isn't um, especially stimulating or innovative in terms of questioning um, these key assumptions about foreign policy. Again, that states are the key actors, it, that they pursue national interests, and that national interest is best pursued through power-seeking strategies. Um, and in reading and thinking about the chapter, I. I when you think about, for example, the, this whole discussion about China's rise or Brazil's rise or India's rise, basically this literature also inserts um, these countries' increasing power into a conventional lens, um, forcing um, Global South scholars themselves to, to dialogue uh, with uh, the community writ large in, in the same terms established by, by conventional know-hows. So the second question is, uh, what is missing? I hope I don't use all my time talking about the conventional. What is missing? Um, and this is going to sound unorganized, perhaps, but I, I wanted to point out several things. Nisar talked about an encounter. The, these chapters are, are divided into three sections. I'm going to call the second section, uh, what is missing from conventional literatures? Um, 
And I think the first thing missing in, in existing ways of thinking about foreign policy is, is recognition that the Westphalian system should not be the starting point for thinking about the global south and its foreign policy. That's the first point that I'd like to make. Um, rather, one could say that the colonial encounter between European and non-European societies provides a more fitting point of departure. Um, one could argue, in fact, that colonialism and imperialism central it, it, have been central to the way that sovereignty and international law, diplomacy, and thus foreign policy have developed. Um, the fact that this imperialist mindset is embedded in these practices and naturalized through them, um, I would argue, allows them, it allows it to renew itself and to present foreign policy and to prevent foreign policy practices that transcend it. That is, there's a logic I I embedded in thinking about international law, sovereignty, foreign policy, diplomacy that somehow prevents. Um, any country from, from, from surpassing this logic and, and, and thinking and acting in an alternative way. Um, uh, this is not my idea. I mean, this is basically um, different literatures that have spoken about the colonial encounter between Spain and the Americas and Francisco de Vitoria's role in the 16th century in, in developing international law. Um, this was, for many, a key moment in thinking about the colonial encounter and how doctrines of sovereignty and international law and, 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 and as a result, uh, foreign policy evolved. Um, Victoria argued that Indians uh, were incapable of sovereignty given uh, their barbarian practices uh, uh, that were contrary to the law of nations, and thus, obviously, that Spain was justified in conquest. In other words, one could argue that international law establishes that certain groups can be excluded from sovereignty because they are different. Um, and in this sense, sovereignty, international law, and by extension, foreign policy are molded by an unlimited exercise of sovereign power against excluded groups uh, and uh, help justify domination, that would be the idea. Um, following decolonialization, um, the dynamic of difference um, that was established through this logic uh, adopted uh, other guises, uh, including the discussion and preoccupation with underdevelopment uh, in the so today's so-called global south, then called third world, and categories such as third world, as well as the creation of international institutions uh, charged with the management of recently created states and problems. Um, one could say that standards such as development, modernization, democracy, governance, uh, economic liberalization, indeed, um, were used to uh, convert and to determine international citizenship of the global south, um, that through foreign policy and showing that it, uh, it accommodated itself to these rules, but it became international citizens. Um, I think that one of the most interesting features of this discourse is it's, it's this discourse meaning um, pre-Westphalian discourses of difference is, is precisely, and, and, and what happened after decolonialization, is its negation of international sources that might um, cause underdevelopment and thwart um, states um, and their process of consolidation. Um, which is why I mentioned dependency theory. How much time do I have left? Five minutes? Okay. Um, I, I'm a strong defender of dependency thinking. I think it's impossible to talk about the global south without it. Um, and, and I think in this sense of foreign policy, um, the dependency school uh, uh, argued that, uh, obviously, that the international capitalist system largely determined the foreign policies of peripheral countries as well as their underdevelopment. Um, and also that class-based alliances that linked elites in the core and periphery also accounted for what happened both inside and, and outside. Um, the effect of both capitalist logics and, and elite group alliances was thus viewed in terms of dependency as, as reproducing dependence and negating state sovereignty. Um, I think this explains why the Global South has placed greater emphasis upon the idea of autonomy, which would be a second point um, that I'd like to make as a central goal of foreign policy in terms of um, problems with the existing literature. Um, I won't define autonomy because I have probably two minutes left, but I, I've written quite a bit on autonomy. I, I think autonomy is a concept um, 
specific to the Global South. Um, there's no textbook called uh, The Challenges of Autonomy for U.S. Foreign Policy or French Foreign Policy. Um, the goal of autonomy, which is political in nature, is something that I see as emerging um, from the problems um, specific to the Global South experienced in foreign policy. Um, can I have, do I still have two minutes to say the alternatives? I still do? Okay. <laughs> All right. Those are kind of the problems. I could probably add more, but um, that's the problems. Um, the alternatives, I, I, I'm still thinking through. Um, I haven't done much research on Bandung um, and, and what it means, but I have noticed that the so-called Bandung spirit is becoming of greater and greater interest in people like me that think about the global south. Um, and so I think that Bandung, um, 19, the 1955 Asian African Conference provides an interesting example of an alternative uh, global south foreign policy in singular that underwrote both the non-aligned movement and um, the G77 along with the, the new international economic order. Um, that it espoused. Um, uh, one of the main goals of this process was to translate um, de jure political sovereignty into effective capacities that would create and develop the legitimacy of post-colonial governments. And for this, shared readings of underdevelopment um, derived largely from dependence, uh, th dependency theory, which is why I think it's important, that is external structural causes um, of, of the Global South's problems, provided a common framework of understanding. I think one question that emerges today is whether or not a, a common framework of understanding um, could be said to exist among the Global South um, in terms of orienting its foreign policy. And I don't really have an answer to that. I, I, I suspect that, that in the way that dependency provided that, un that underlying framework, it's really difficult to speak of one um, today. And that would be a question that, that, that I would hope to answer in, in the chapter. Um, although this movement was revisionist, um, if not counter hegemonic, hegemon and that it pr proposed alternative principles of engagement, such as the principles of, co of peaceful coexistence and foreign policy. Something that, 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 that's interesting is that it never challenged the Westphalian system per se, nor the centrality uh, of the state as a key actor of foreign policy. Um, and one could say that in failing to subvert the existing international rules of the political and economic game, Third world internationalism and foreign policy um, ultimately doomed itself to failure. That is, um, it's in its own obsession with the state, um, the third world international movement uh, essentially, if I'm correct in what I'm saying, um, doomed. It was it was part and parcel to its own its own doom. Um, and, and one could say, as many people already have, that the debt crisis of the 1980s and neoliberalism largely marked the end of, of Global South foreign policy singular. Um, and so again, the question is whether or not today we're seeing something different replacing what happened um, between the 1950s and the 1970s emerging. Um, that's the question, whether or not um, today uh, there are different alternatives for thinking about Global South foreign policy. And here I'll just name four things and I'm gonna finish now, four ideas that come to mind. South-South cooperation has been heralded herald recently as a new form of horizontal interaction um, that replaces power and influence as key goals of foreign policy with other types of interaction. Um, I think that's an overstatement of the importance and the nature of South-South cooperation. Um, Brazil has become an important cooperator. Uh, China, Colombia is now exporting security to many of its neighbors in Central America. Um, I have a hard time thinking of this as an alternative means of, of looking at foreign policy. Uh, second alternative would be leftist governments critical of neoliberal globalization and neoliberal capitalism. Here I'm thinking of the ALBA countries in Latin America. Most importantly, Venezuela when Chavez was alive. Um, and, and different um, anti anti counter hegemonic or anti anti-Western alliances um, that they've established with countries such as Iran. Um, I'm not sure that that provides an alternative, but it would be something to think of. Um, a third possibility would be um, 
social groups participating in foreign policy, which is, I think, where I should be focusing. And here, perhaps the alter-globalization movement um, would be something to look at. Um, someone mentioned in, in, in their comments, um, not only the Arab Spring, but Occupy Wall Street and different manifestations of discontent with the existing um, neoliberal order. Um, I, I wonder if one could consider that foreign policy would be something that, that I would ask. And finally, um, in listening to Nisar, a, a final idea, a fourth, came to mind for alternatives. Um, the question of indigeneity has been reflected upon um, increasingly, especially in contexts such as Latin America. And I wonder if one could talk about indigenous um, foreign policies. That is, um, the role not only of just normal, normal, well, no, not normal and abnormal, social actors such as indigenous groups um, as, as agents of foreign policy. And, and I'm sure that there we would find something completely different as well. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Arlene. Um, as an undergraduate student, I hope that I can be helpful to you all, giving you the point of view of a student and what would we expect out of these new and different ways of teaching international affairs and international theory, um, specifically right now with the topic of foreign policy. I completely agree with what Arlene, um, what you're trying to express that these ideas of foreign policy should be viewed from a point of view of pre-colonialism and before these, all of these Westphalian ideas have started to begin to be, started to be created. I, the idea of natural national interest and versus identity, I think is very important because the states in the global south, I believe, have. If you look back in history, we, they haven't have, had time to develop an identity. And as you said, their national interest has always been focused on how to, I guess in simple terms, how to fit in within the, the, the realm of international, international relations and how they can gain a more important place within this, within this framework. Um, I think national interest, I, maybe this is a very positivist point of view as a student that has not a lot of background in this area, but colonialism and imperialism have made these states and part of that foreign part of the global south gain titles that maybe are not that they're non-existent, but that they have been implied by the West, by West feeling um, states. In the example of Latin America, I mean, we can go back in history and see how Latin, the, the term of Latin America was given by the United States or by the Spanish and by all these um, colonialists that came in and wanted to civilize um, people in, in the Americas. And I think it's important to distinguish the difference, the differences between culture, between um, politics, between economics, as you mentioned in the beginning of your outline, because we, these, all of these states have been bunched up together as a block and we don't really give importance to the differences between them instead of how similar they are. And the only similarity, as you mentioned, is that they have been colonialized and they have gone through process of imperialism and I think this is where it's important to look at South-South alliances, although you, uh, Arlene mentioned that it maybe is a little bit of a very positive view of where things can go to. I think it's very important because I don't think there's a possibility of completely eliminating the role of the West, but maybe diminishing it and putting more focus on these alliances between the, um, South and South, for example, um, between Latin America and Asia, there's a lot of increasing communication right now, politically or, not, or more, more precisely economically, and I think that's very important. Um, uh, I guess the problem of what you, what you mentioned many times, this problem of identity, I think is very important. And I think as a student, we would be very interested in looking more into that because when we're learning, we only we look at what the West has already created and we don't look at pre-colonialism 
before civilization, before civilization against barbarianism. And this brings me to introducing an idea that I've always thought of, of how there's this hierarchy of values that's been set in the world in general, how the global south is, they, they're given these, what, the values that are supposed to be important, but in reality, them as an individual, their national interests can be completely different, but they never had time to, they never had time to, I guess you can say, create their own goals or create their own values, so they have applied their, they try to fit in with the, with the West and try to make their values become the West's values, but it doesn't really work out because these global South countries have completely different values as, as in culture, for example. They, they have completely different values in culture, politics, or economics, but they don't notice this or these aren't given enough attention because they're trying, they're, there's a lot of time being put in trying to fit in with the West instead of creating their own. I think um, these points that you mentioned of what is missing in foreign policy has to do directly with this, that states don't have enough time to, to create these, these goals for natural in, national interest and instead their national interest becomes the West's national interest. As you gave an example of sovereign power, how in history they, they did not believe that Indians had the power to be able to become sovereign. So, and you could see it as well with leaders in Latin America, how they, they alone gave, you can, I don't know, you can talk about Simon Bolivar, how he gave up on, he didn't, he didn't give up, but he, after making a big change, he kind of, what he proposed to the elitists in Latin America is to, to get out of there because there's this idea of how they, they can't develop sovereignty alone, but they, they have to depend on the West. And this is where you're, the importance that you give to dependency theory, I agree completely that it should be a very predominant topic, or at least in this chapter of, if there is a chapter of pre-colonialism and how these, these states in the global south have been developed before colonialism, I think the dependency theory is completely relevant and it's a very important um, topic that should be considered and um, talked about more, more broadly. Mm, well, you touched on the end about the Bandung spirit and how legitimate it is or how much it's, it's been seen in these, these past years. And I personally did not have a lot of background on the Bandung spirit or uh, not a lot of background on any of this, but um, specifically on the Bandung spirit. And I think this, that you, the problems that you, that you brought up in the end can connect completely with what you mentioned at the beginning of, de of being able to define or being able to, to put, I guess, labels and names on these different topics in the global south because the banding spirit, I think, promotes these alliances between south and south that you mentioned um, briefly. At the end, you also mentioned how we, there's never been a questioning of, of the Westphalian West West way of thinking and how these global south countries have doomed themselves. So as a student, I think there should, there, it would be interesting to see an area of how, how this idea of how these states have doomed themselves has taken place and how it can be, con not contradicted, but how to find an answer to these questions or these doubts of how these southern um, global south countries have doomed themselves. And I think that's, those are the only comings, comments that I have. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We're nearing the graveyard shift, so I hope you all manage to stay awake. I'm including myself in that as well. Um, I just want to start off echo echoing some of what Nizar and Arlene have just said, that I've really found this a very agonizing process and a very frustrating one at that. And, and I'm afraid that the, what I've ended up with, and I just ha discussed this a bit with Jonathan before, is, is you know, it's not what I wanted to end up with. So it's, it's still very conventional. It's very descriptive. So what I'm saying is I need your help. 
basically, at the, at the start. Um, when I first wrote this chapter a year ago, I started off, the title was actually around institutions and cooperation, and order was kind of a, a sideline. And then as I was thinking about this again more recently, and I'd, I'd done some other work on order, I started, suddenly realized that actually this, maybe it would be more interesting just to focus on order. But the result is that I still have bits and pieces of the previous chapter in here, because I think it's kind of all related, order, institutions, cooperation, but that makes for a very confusing chapter. So, and I'm not sure which parts should remain and which shouldn't, so I'm hoping Jonathan's gonna help me with that as well. Um, the other thing I need to say is that, unfortunately, I don't have this clear division which Navnita, for example, had between the three sections that you know, we were supposed to follow the instructions to have these three sections in the chapter. And the reason I don't have this division is because, as, as Nizar said earlier, I really found that I was, trying, I was forcing difference. I was trying to find difference where perhaps there wasn't difference, um, and so, you know, I, I think Nizar framed it perfectly that we shouldn't constrain ourselves to, to finding alternatives in a kind of geographical sense. So uh, the other thing is that I found as I was talking about, um, you know, the kind of traditional story about institutions and order, I kind of felt that I wanted to also bring in the role of the global south in sometimes maintaining these, these instruments of global order. So, and I didn't kind of want to put that in a separate section, so, yeah. So, yeah, I need help. Um, anyway, so I'm just going to briefly outline what, I've, what I have covered in the chapter. Um, and so, I do start off with that, at least I got that part right. I start off with, the, with uh, really why we're doing this, that we, we're usually just confronted with the Western story. Um, and just to remind ourselves again why it's important for us to look Beyond the Western story, I came across this, uh, something that uh, an African scholar, Bangura, mentioned. He talks about how in, in old movies about Africa, uh, they often feature a scene where there's a confrontation between a local witch doctor and a Western doctor, uh, with the latter usually symbolizing the triumph of Western science and society by saving the chief himself, or at least one of his children. Um, <laughs> Bangura then laments and he says, sadly, for the children of modern medicine, it turns out that there were a few tricks in the medicine man's or witch doctor's bag that were ignored or lost in the euphoria of such a victory for science. So I think that just again reminds us that, you know, there are stories out there which we really, some of them have been lost, I think, but I think there are others that can still be, still be rescued. So what I do then is I, I very briefly look at order, the, you know, what does this concept mean? Um, and of course, it's, it's again one of those concepts in IR, like I think all of the ones that we've been discussing, it's essentially a contested concept, but even though it is contested, um, it's often used in IR without, it, without any kind of interrogation about what it really means. Um, and so again, this was my first kind of obstacle, you know, how, how do you think about order? Well, you can think about notions of order and ordering in a very broad sense. Um, if we just think of how the world is ordered spatially in terms of maps, uh, you know, European cartographers played, placed Europe at the center of the world. If we just think about maybe placing Asia or Latin America at the center of the map, what would, do, what would that do in terms of shifting our perceptions um, about the world? Then also there's generally a, a, this distinction made between order as something that comes about naturally versus order as something that must be constructed or actually you know, brought about. Um, and as we know that anarchy, in other words, the assumption that the system is naturally in disorder, is one of the founding principles of the field of international relations. I think it, the result is that most theorists believe that order has to be somehow created. Um, and of course, they have different ideas about how that, how that works. Um, realists focus on balance of power politics, liberals focus on cooperation. Um, and again, you know, here again is the problem, how many existing kind of mainstream theories do you look at um, and, you know, what do you leave out? So I remember from last time, um, Arlene asked me why I hadn't mentioned Hedley Bull, so I did bring Hedley Bull into this chapter. Um, so I, you know, I use Hedley Bull's definition of order as those patterns or dispositions of human activity that achieve and sustain the elementary or primary goals of social life among mankind as a whole. The problem with that definition, of course, is that there's the assumption that there's consensus about humankind about what those goals are. So there's this kind of inbuilt universalism. Um, and that also, I think, speaks to the way in which many, many mainstream scholars think about world order in a very unidimensional way. So if we think of realists, they focus on the distribution of power as being, uh, as determining order. Um, so they prioritize stability, they take a state-centric view, uh, 
and therefore they engage in these endless debates um, about whether we're currently in a uni or a bi or a multipolar order and which of these would be preferable. Um, what they leave out and what they don't ask is who benefits from this order? What kind of order would entail a qualitatively better life for the majority of the world's people? Um, and I find this again in current you know, questions around what is the future order going to look like? Is it going to be the US's liberal order? Is it going to be China's order? Um, but people aren't really asking questions about the type of order and what is it going to mean for people in you know, rural Africa, for example. And so what I then do is I briefly look at what I call a history of order and institutionalization. And I start with you know, these ideas that uh, we all know from IR textbooks. Uh, you know, where did the liberal order start? Of course, it's a long philosophical tradition. And of course, the piece of Westphalia features in that as well, as it always does. Um, and then I get to today's global order, which really I think is the kind of liberal economic order. It's, uh, it includes a multilateral system of global governance centered on the UN system, but also including the Bretton Woods institutions. And the other thing I think that's characteristic of the current uh, order is, th is this idea that liberal democracy is the only legitimate form of government. Um, and then I quote um, Eikenberry, who interestingly makes an important what makes an in a point that I agree with. Um, he says that America and the West have laid down the rules and institutions of the post-war world. They've been its creators, owners, managers, and chief beneficiaries. So really, from the vantage point of, of most of the global South, the order is one that has been imposed on them one that is associated with inequality and injustice, but also one that they have been complicit in upholding, um, which I then discuss later in the chapter, mainly because they have not had much choice in the matter. Um, and so although this liberal international order has become the dominant order globally, this does not mean that it doesn't currently have competitors or does, that it remains uncontested. But I also make the point that this, is, this also is true historically. It's always been a contested order. There have always been alternative ideas about international order. Um, I then move on to look at international institutions because I believe that global institutions are crucial, crucial instruments in establishing and also upholding uh, any kind of world order. So in that sense, I guess I'm you know, siding with the Coxian view of, of international in institutions as being a means of stabilizing and perpetuating uh, a particular order. Part of global ordering is also the establishment of rules that actors are expected to abide by if they want to participate in it. Rules are regarded as necessary to produce and maintain a particular order and have become a kind of ad admission ticket to global political recognition, participation in the global trading system, access to international development assistance, and so forth. Um, and then I briefly look at the development of international law, and this kind of also ties up with what Arlene said just now, um, this idea that the development of international law was closely linked to European ideas about the superiority of European civilization, which basically allowed Europe to assert its right to lead the world on the basis of a set of supposedly universal rules. Um, and again, as Arlene said, of course, a distinction was made between the so-called civilized and the uncivilized, so you know, who those rules apply to. Um, and I just mentioned, I thought this was an interesting example. Those of you who've read uh, Mark Mazower's book, he mentions this example about Japan that was only recognized um, after it defeated Russia in the 1905 war. Uh, and he quotes a Jap uh, Japanese diplomat who at the time said, we show ourselves at least your equals in scientific butchery and are at once admitted to your council tables as civilized men. Um, and so the rules of international society, uh, including the rules of war, thus did not apply to the uncivilized or the unrecognized peoples and parts of the world. Um, then I look into a section, and, and this is the section that I'm not sure about, it's from the old chapter, which is why do states comply with international rules? Um, and then I look at what realists say about this, what liberals say about this, constructivists, Marxists, um, and I'm thinking that perhaps I should replace this with more of a discussion on balance of power from a realist position rather than looking at why states cooperate or don't cooperate, I don't know. So that's, that's a kind of question mark in the paper. I then move on to look at the global south and international institutions. Because even though most of the institutions of the current global order were created by states in the, in the global south, states from 
uh, sorry, from the global north, states from the global south have been eager to participate in these institutions, and we know the reasons why smaller, less powerful states tend to, uh, uh, and this is something that perhaps Arlene, you might want to mention in your chapter, I mean, they use multilateralism um, as a foreign policy strategy because, because they, don't, they don't really have an option to act unilaterally. Um, and of course, as we've seen more and more states become independent, we've seen that the states of the global south have actually used institutions like the UN to raise issues of common concern and also to legitimize new norms. Um, and I'm not going to repeat some of what Arlene has just said now. Of course, within the UN through the G77 and UNCTAG, they've uh, um, tried to strengthen their collective power. They've also done so, so outside of the UN through uh, organizations like the Non-Aligned Movement. Uh, I'll skip through some of this. So even though we've seen a kind of continued resistance through, for example, calls for the new international economic order coming from the South, the developing world has also been largely conformist um, in terms of, you know, uh, playing a role in making international rooms and ab abiding by international rules. And I think an interesting example, which I mentioned this morning, is the South's continuing support for norms of sovereignty and non-intervention which of course are two of the foundational norms on which the current international order is built. Um, and over the past decade, with increasing global acceptance of the principles of responsibility to protect, we've witnessed a situation in the, where the South appears to be preserving and almost defending the norm of sovereignty, while the North progressively questions it. Um, and I think the other thing is interesting, and this plays to this idea that norms are you know, just constantly imposed on the global South from the global North, again, uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but R2P actually has distinctly African roots. It's not a Western conception, both in terms of its conceptualization and its implementation. Um, the idea behind it, the idea of sovereign, sovereignty as responsibility, um, was actually originally the brainchild of Sudanese scholar-diplomat uh, Francis Deng. Um, and so even today, even though today we see scholarly debates on the topic are often dominated by Western viewpoints, uh, with the general assumption being that African states are opposed to R2P, we find that the African Union and other African regional organizations have actually taken leading roles in, in implementing R2P. So, despite the examples mentioned above, um, the majority of the instruments of global order were created by an exclusive club of states and continue to serve their, their interests. And so we have seen a lot of contestation, calls for reform, um, and I'm not going to go into this, but I talk a bit about, uh, you know, debates around UN Security Council reform in particular, because I think that's still one of the main, uh, that's the, probably the main institution that, uh, where its legitimacy is questioned. So finally, I move to alternative perspectives on order. Lily, timing? Seven minutes, okay, great. Um, and, and so here, this is where I started struggling, because then I realized the more I was reading on different conceptions of order, I found that there was actually a lot of interesting stuff that was not coming from the global self. Um, and so, for example, Howard uh, Alker, for example, uh, you know, he makes this interesting point that the world is simultaneously being shaped by a multiplicity of coexisting world orders, present not only in different regions of the world, but even within states, and at any given time, um, which I think is a very useful way to think about order, that even though we have this dominant order, they're always contesting um, and multiple orders at play at any given time and in any given place. Um, but what I then do is I, I focus on, because that of course was the brief, so I, I tried to find some African authors that have written about order, and I found one, Ali Mazrui. Um, and so Masri argues that one of the persistent themes and perceptions of world order has been this dichotomous us-them distinction. Um, and he says that although some element of dualism is unavoidable in political thinking, um, it's also culturally relative and much uh, more pronounced in cultures with monotheistic religions, of which Christ Christianity has had the greatest impact on recent world order. So in Christianity, the distinction between believers and non-believers or heathens or barbarians eventually became a more secular distinction between the civilized and the uncivilized based on, among, amongst other factors, race. And this, of course, led to the idea that the civilized had a right to dominate uh, the uncivilized. And this dualism is still visible today in the divide between what we call the developed or the developing countries, with development having become the central divide in the configuration of the globe.
And again, this is a section where I think maybe I should look a bit more at the new international economic order, non-alignment as, as an alternative view of order, um, Chinese views of order, but again, you know, limitations in, time, in terms of, uh, of, of word count as well. Um, given time constraints, I'm going to skip over some of, uh, some of the other stuff that Mazri says. Uh, he, for example, he links the notion of freedom with world order as well, which I think um, raises some interesting questions. Um, then this other point that I make that, that, that kind of comes out of general things I've read that African scholars have written is, is that I think while Western notions of order are predominantly based on securing stability and security, and I've, I picked up on, I don't know if Ben is still here, um, in his comment this morning on Navnita's paper, uh, he, he talked about the, the goal of international relations and it seemed that he was convinced that you know, security was the main goal. And this, I think, is the, is the idea behind Western notions of order. It's all about stability and security, whereas as I think for Africans at least, and maybe this applies to the rest of the global south as well, uh, people are really more interested in, in you know, what are the socioeconomic and the qualitative aspects of order. Um, and again, here it's important to note that there have also been attempts to conceptualize alternative world orders along these lines in the global north. Um, and I'm thinking of the World Order Models Project, for example. Um, so this raises questions about assumptions of difference, that the liberal order is necessarily a foreign construct, uh, which was forcefully imposed on the non-Western world, um, when in fact many values and norms associated with the West have multiple origins. Right, then I also briefly talk a bit about signs that the contemporary international order is characterized by increasingly con conflicting views about future global order. And this development relates to the emergence of so-called rising powers from the global south. And here, I think I disagree a bit with what Joao said earlier today, and, and I've only recently started disagreeing with this idea. Um, so this idea that, you know, basically the Eikenberry idea that, uh, you know, the emerging powers really just want a seat at the table and, you know, they're willing to be co-opted, etc. I think if you actually look at what these states are doing, yes, they are taking on board some aspects of the existing global order. Um, but on the other hand, they do seem to be challenging others. For example, if we look at the Security Council, we see that a clear divide has emerged between traditional Western powers and the emerging powers about the sovereignty versus intervention debate. Um, China appears to be leading the way by presenting an alternative revised version of existing UN Charter provisions founded in its, in its peaceful coexistence principles of mutual respect for sovereignty, territorial integrity, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, I think China is also presenting the uh, developing countries with an alternative model of economic development, um, and therefore, arguably, an alternative path to modernity, which, which is very attractive to African countries in particular. Um, of course, it's also challenging, together with other emerging powers like India and Brazil, and to a lesser extent South Africa, it's challenging existing Western models of development assistance. And so existing IR frameworks based on the liberal Western model are simply not adequate in helping us to make sense of these new developments in the international system. So finally I get to, okay, so you know, where do we go from here? And as previous speakers have said, this is the, this is the weakest part of my chapter. Um, so, Aspects of the changing order that I think are also interesting in terms of thinking differently are these complex processes of political ordering that create highly uneven articulation processes between the state and non-governmentally controlled spaces. In light of this, I think if we shift our focus from states to non-state actors, alternative notions of order become possible. Um, and you know, previous uh, speakers have commented on this, on this as well, that we need to really move away from a state-centric perspective. And I think here Africa presents a particular challenge to existing theory. On the continent, there are spaces where the state has never exerted an, ex an exclusive monopoly on the use of force and where its power has and is still being met with hostility. Um, Sub-state actors such as warlords are not merely exceptions to the state system, but they should be seen as constituting an alternative practice to the state system. So in trying to think differently, we should focus on the local construction of global order. Uh, I think this would open up countless uh, potentially new fruitful avenues for theorizing. Another way in which world order is understood in the Western tradition is the anarchy versus hierarchy dichotomy, which was also mentioned this morning. So again, I think there's a lot of overlap between chapters. Um, 
So the idea, as I said earlier, that anarchy is the defining feature of the international system lies at the heart of questions around international order. And this neat distinction between anarchy and hierarchy again becomes especially problematic when we try to understand the situation in many African countries. In light of Western-led military interventions and the dominant role played by multinational corporations and um, NGOs in many developing states, we do seem to find ourselves in a hierarchical world in which some states are more sovereign than others. So, we're currently in a period where existing knowledge structures are being unsettled and we're presented with a very exciting opportunity, I think for students as well, where you know, we have the opportunity to imagine alternatives to the current world order. And I think again, and, and this, this speaks to the, the, the kind of broader idea behind this textbook project, our thinking does not have to be radically new. Um, we also do not have to discard existing concepts and ideas on which the field of IR has been built. If we look closely at what is currently happening in the world, for example, with regard to the behavior of emerging powers, I think this can provide us with the empirical basis from which to develop new frameworks for thinking about international relations. It would appear that instead of Eikenberry's premise that emerging states will simply be co-opted into the liberal order, um, we're currently seeing a re-articulation or reinterpretation of the liberal order um, by non-Western states, rather than simply a wholesale acceptance or an, a, a complete rejection of it. So reinterpreting and adapting existing concepts is an important step in advancing our thinking. And finally, we also need to be more creative in uncovering new sources and not only limit ourselves to those that meet the subjective criteria of Western science. Um, and in terms of looking at sources, you know, Lily has provided us with a fantastic example with her book that was uh, just recently released. So we can look at African fables, Hindu epics, works of literature, popular culture and religion. Um, there are alternative stories out there. They're often hidden. They're often difficult to find. Um, and that's why I haven't included them in this part of the chapter. I'm hoping to, so I'm searching. Um, and if any of you have any suggestions, please share them with me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, Lily, Laurent, and others who have made this all possible. And thanks for the invitation to come and comment. This is a fabulous project. Uh, and, uh, and I'm very happy to have this opportunity to, to talk with you. Um, this paper is a plea for a new basis of knowledge that can transform the dominant Westphalian concept of global order, which, as it points out, inhibits agency in the global south as well as imagination among uh, scholars in the global north and, and the global south. Um, and I greatly honor and appreciate the uh, grappling that this paper has with some of the more difficult questions within and beyond the field. So I want to group my remarks into four questions, although they're not questions for you, they're questions of, you know, what is this, you know, a question of. So the first grouping is um, a question of change, which from the bit that I've picked up from the earlier presentations is a reoccurring issue uh, here. Um, at the paper's core is really the relation of self and other that haunts international relations as manifested through power. Right? This comes through, through as you read the paper. Power in the, in the, re, in the realist sense coming from as the previous presentations were pointing out, an unwillingness to see difference as anything other than a version of the self. This proclivity to interpret the other in the category of the self is famously at work not only for the strong as a form of self-justification, but also for the quote-unquote weak as a form of internalization. Right? So the IR master narrative of order that you explore here is presented I think properly, as a totalizing narrative in which difference must be converted into sameness. And this justifies some of the things that you talk about in there, the double standard, which is really a double movement, which allows you to violate your own standards and someone else's putative interests. Because of this paradox of self and other, uh, that is, the paradox of always interpreting the other in the category of the self, the rising economic or even military influence of the global south does not necessarily change the narrative, it does not change the totalizing narrative of order. Um, and that was brought up in Arlene's point as well. So this raises the question at the heart of the paper, how is change possible 
right, if we're not just talking about inversion. And there are two possible answers to this, which the paper intimates or, or, or uses. One, you could call, although I don't like this metaphor, but you could call it the hard version, which is that change within the symptom, uh, symptom huh? change within the system is impossible, as in the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house, right? The soft version uh, is that gradual change within the system is possible, right? And the paper implies more or less this latter idea than the former. Um, so this raises the second set of questions, which is a question of critique. Or more specifically, what is the role of critique in trying to figure out what change is possible? And here, gradual change, which the paper is more or less advocating, requires an epistemological and ontological shift that can destabilize the self just enough to allow new narratives to contend. And to achieve this, there are two kinds of critique that could help bring this about. The first is an imminent critique which forces the dominant narrative to be consequential and to live up to its claims. And this idea of, you know, of, uh, of, of um, countries from the global south uh, trying to force the liberal order to, let it, to, to, to live up to its claims of formal equality in order to give it a role within these multilateral systems is part of this imminent critique. And the imminent critique is very powerful. I mean, from the Haitian Revolution to abolitionism to suffragists to gay marriage uh, to civil rights, um, these imminent critiques can be deeply transformative. So they're, they're, they're very, very important. And they involve strategies of shaming, of unmasking, of emasculating in order to ultimately be inclusive. The other kind of critique, the non-imminent critique, um, could be called, uh, an, uh, pick this kind of arcane word, um, an adventitious critique. You could say an ex extrinsic critique, but I didn't so much like the sense of X being coming from without. So adventitious, a word which I've actually never really seen used, if you look it up, it says, coming from another source, not from the usual location. So having a critique coming from another source, not from the usual location, is quite challenging and difficult because by definition, we can't fully apprehend such a critique we can't fully understand such a critique if we want to completely avoid appropriating it into our own categories. So to avoid problems of incommensurability, we need some kind of hermeneutic apparatus to help us understand adventitional critiques, non-imminent critiques. This paper, and this comes to the third question of, which is the question of the purpose of the paper, question of purpose. This paper explores both imminent and adventitious critique, though more the question of imminent critique. And the paper implicitly critiques the I in IR as standing for a universal Western subject, and instead pleads for a we, a we are instead of an I am, which is very much what you say at, at the end where you, you read about here we can pick up from African fables, Hindu epics versus literature, and so forth. This call for multiplicity is very welcome, and I would seek to maybe push it in a couple of ways. And here is where you'll start to notice that I've drifted far from IR. <laughs> um, first, perhaps, Less, it's less the we are than the ungrammatical formulation I are, as in I A R E, right? That gets at the multiplicities that crowd the edges of this essay. I are, grammatically wrong, is both singular and plural, and it attests to the imbrication of both. And this might allow the paper to treat the West as plural, uh, um, to treat it as plural as the non-West, which you've made a, a motion towards in, in the comments here, um, and break the centrality of the term West as a reference point, which, which, which focuses very, very centrally in, in, in the paper. Secondly, and maybe even more off base, 
maybe forget the I in IR completely, or better yet, forget IR. As I read the paper, I kept feeling it shift between a critique of global order and an epistemological critique of IR. And while this does point to the ways in which IR, international relations, is implicated in reality, um, it also hypostatizes IR. In other words, it gives it a real identity to this concept. And IR, the field, becomes a noun with capital letters that can be named but never actually realized. Um, IR becomes a symptom, and this is how I kept, as I was reading this, like something, okay, IR becomes a symptom of continual deferral of the thing itself. And the thing it, itself, in, in, at the heart of this paper, I felt, was this question of difference. The effect is, ironically, to keep IR at the center while calling for its decentering. And this may be more of a bigger critique of some of IR than just you, but, uh, but, but this is one of the issues which you, you, you and you were both raising about you know, how do we grapple with what it is that we're actually doing here, and how do we get out of the trap of keeping IR at the center while calling for its decentering? Um, and this leads almost to your questions at the end about, so what should I do with this section? How should I, you know, I, I want to come up with things which I don't know yet what I want to say. So I would say, you don't have to follow my advice, obviously, uh, but I would say, why even start with a dominant narrative? Why even start with, you know, this is how order is constructed in the West, this is 1648, this is all these things, right? right? I was, of course, nodding as I was reading through the overview of the emergence of the contemporary global order, right? I was like, yep, check, okay, right, I got that. But why not start from some perspective that confuses us or unsettles us? Um, and I'm sorry, why even mention Eikenberry? <laughs> um, I'm sure he's a very nice person. I don't mean anything, I don't know him personally. Uh, <laughs> so this is nothing personal, but why should we care about him? I, I almost felt a bit like he was a little bit of a straw man. Um, he's probably not gonna listen to you so are you really talking to him? Um, so this slogan jumped into my mind while I was reading it. Don't perpetuate, liberate. <laughs> so, you know, maybe I'm confusing types of critique here. And if this is really an imminent critique, then you do need to work within. Uh, it is strategic to stay within the narrative um, in order to explode it. Uh, but if the essay seeks an adventitious critique coming from another source, as the ending implies very clearly, then I, I do wish it were bolder. Um, rather than calling for an epistemological shift, maybe there'd be some way to actually make it, embody that epistemological shift. And that raises the last question, and I'll stop with this, which is, a question of the question. And this probably is more of an even meta, more meta question because this is in the context of a, of a, of a textbook and all the other chapters and, and, um, and I, I've only read this one. So maybe I'd have a different sense of it if I'd read all of them. But um, if the paper does see itself as an imminent critique, I might suggest not trying to be as all-inclusive as it is and instead giving sharper contours to what seems to be its strongest focus on institutions of global governance and the changing role of the global south from object to agent. Um, and this changing role could be highlighted in two ways. First, by expanding on the so-called developing countries as co-shapers of our normative order, which is what you do and what I gather you've also worked on in other settings, so the institutional level. But second, by expanding on, and here's where you could look for some cases that you could even start with a vignette or a narrative from, empirical points of intersection between these institutions and what you're calling non-state actors. Focusing on the latter, this point of intersection where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, um, uh, is, is, is intimated towards the end as being where the action is. And I really agree and giving it a different level of attention and maybe even bringing that in as, a, as a, the start, um, you know, think cinematically, uh, could push 
your R, IR, your IR, from a study of top-down state-ordered frameworks for norm setting, which all of you that I've heard acknowledge but don't like, to a confused, conflicted, make it up as you go along framework of emergence that one actually sees on the ground, right? I mean, I wonder, you know, if you look at where R2P is being implemented and how, you probably see a make it up as you go along a lot more than you do anything else. Um, and you see then interlocking, overlapping, and juxtaposing orders that are constantly making and remaking the world order. Um, so maybe, maybe the old order is more out of order and we feel comfortable admitting. So, thank, thank you. you very much. War and conflict, financing wars. There's a Keynesian idea which preceded Keynes that you don't have to pay off the war debt, you just pay off the interest on the war debt. In fact, people are still collecting from the Napoleonic Wars. In that case, you basically have the idea of a free war. And when you have that, then good faith, bad faith becomes an issue, which America has, in a sense, been in involved in. It's like, instead of a just war, unjust war, it's a justifiable war. So I think we've sort of moved down into that world, whereas finance is really a director of whether or not you go to war and whether or not you don't go to war. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Navnita. Wait, wait for the microphone. It's um, less of a question, actually, more of a um, comment and a kind of suggestion for all the three papers. Um, for Nizar's paper, you know, uh, on war and conflict, I mean, one aspect that I found which is um, sort of conspicuously offered from a global south point of view uh, in terms of understanding conflict is the idea of the structural violence where no weapons are used uh, by sheer hunger uh, sanctions, what happened in Iraq, what happened in Afghanistan uh, through the instrumentality of sanctions uh, and the hunger that is imposed on people and the structural violence that is taking place. Uh, you know, so that is a phenomenon that you do not witness as a matter of fact in Global North, but is very central to our understanding of how conflict is undergoing a change uh, uh, in, 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 in that point of view. And um, also I think somewhere, maybe just by way of a footnote, the idea of the kind of collateral damage that uh, is considered to be increasingly acceptable, uh, you know, drone attacks in Afghanistan, in the name of war on terrorism, you kill one guy that you really wanted to kill, but along with that, if you kill 50 other people, well, then that's acceptable because that's collateral damage. Uh, you know, so problematizing these categories uh, uh, that is happening, I think somewhere, maybe in a small box, um, it's, it would be useful to uh, uh, sort of engage with that. And, um, I was going by your comment earlier on uh, by saying uh, if uh, the understanding was that gender was going to somehow figure in all papers rather than be confined to one chapter, uh, you didn't mention anywhere about the gendered nature of war. And there is a lot of literature on that. So somewhere, if you can uh, bring that in, uh, it would be useful. Other, I think, interesting way was that you, what you ended with, and I think your uh, uh, you know, discussant also talked about is actually looking at the war from the perspective of the victims of the war. I think that will bring in a very refreshingly new perspective of understanding the whole phenomenon of the war and the conflict. It's really turning it upside down, so to say. Uh, uh, I don't know to what an extent uh, literature exists on this or not, uh, so I'm not really able to, uh, I'm not a, uh, of much help over there, but I think it would help you turn the whole concept upside down in terms of looking at the alternatives by just looking at it a very different perspective. Uh, uh, for um, Arlene, I think what you ended over there in your uh, sort of uh, almost concluding remarks is actually a space uh, for you to explore is understanding foreign policy from social actors' point of view. 
I mean, some of the things that I'm teaching in my classroom, foreign policy analysis, you know, I mean, in a state of Andhra Pradesh, when the farmers are committing suicides, what has that got to do with the globalization? And, uh, you know, foreign policy objectives, how much is India giving in, into WTO issues? There's some really exciting debates uh, that are emerging out there. So I think in alternatives, that's one space which you already are sort of on your horizon uh, that you can explore. And along with Bandung, I think NAM is perhaps in a historical context at least. Uh, you know, it was a lot about creating a niche for foreign policy making, which was autonomous. Uh, you talked about autonomy of the uh, uh, you know space, so I think that allows you an anchor, so to say, to engage with that kind of a debate in a historical context. Very briefly, so um, Karen, uh, you know, one of the elements uh, since you do engage uh, a little bit with the history, I found uh, missing was as to how the whole debate on neo died. I think that's a very very interesting story out there. Uh, that needs a little retrieval uh, uh, for students. The demand for the new economic world order in 70s, you know, as to how the whole demand uh, of being uh, fought in the domain of UNCTAD when it shifted to GATT, uh, it was not just a forum shift, it was actually the death of the debate itself. Uh, and it was one move that the Global South had historically pitched for uh, in terms of a new world economic order. And it just literally died a unsung death uh, uh, in that sense. So I think that's a very interesting story out there. Um, and the other one that I could suggest to you was because you do engage with the question of international law. And I, this is something that I could give you loads of references on because I've just used it in uh, one of my recent books. There's a very rich literature that is emerging from uh, uh, Asia uh, on international law and international order. Uh, and uh, there's some really good, exciting debates that are happening there where uh, they're able to use a particular space to actually talk about the universal, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, that conversation itself is very interesting uh, for you to engage in. And your, I mean, where you put it, whether what's missing or alternatives is once you read it, you'll, uh, you'll uh, uh, find out. You know, R2P, I mean, I was very interested when you said that it had African roots. That was news to me. Uh, I thought it was the middle powers, you know, I mean, what we hear about R2P is Canada and others. But uh, there, maybe there's a story of maybe the roots are such, but when you discursively adopt something and you completely reshape it, retool it, return it, that's not what we hear. I mean, I have never, I've, I've heard, I've attended conferences on R2P exclusively. This is the first time I have ever heard that this debate had African roots. Uh, so there is definitely something missing there. And, uh, you know, that sort of uh, uh, needs to be brought out. In a historical context, I think you do need to look at WOMP, uh, the World Order Model Project. I think it has, again, some interesting elements of the story there because it was based on an engagement and a conversation between the South and the North. And that is what historically is actually very interesting uh, 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 to look at. And again, in a historical context, NAM, because I mean, when you look at Nehruvian uh, idea of uh, NAM, he actually explicitly says that this was his vision of creating an instrumentality for an alternative world order. So, I mean, whether it worked out or not is a you know, uh, matter of debate, but uh, the point is that's how it was envisaged. And there is a very, by the way, there's a very interesting document that has come now of non-alignment 2.0, which is, you know, sort of re-looking at the whole debate of non-alignment from an international order perspective. So they are kind of reviving the whole debate in terms of seeing as to where uh, does this debate has any future or uh, uh, it doesn't go anywhere. The one question I have is for Jonathan. Have you written about this very exciting idea of your IR and decentering? Because I would love to read that. <laughs> and I was wondering if you could explain a little more because I, I found it really fascinating. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Shwa. Shwa. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Nizar, I'm wondering. As I, as I hear all the, the interventions, I'm wondering if what the make of the book will be really. 
um, how's the book going to look like? I mean, because we've been talking about, you know, ideas and projects from the South, most of them that were unsuccessful. So is this going to be a book about what really didn't work out for the South? <laughs> How it should have worked out, and you know, uh, it risked being you know a, whine, a lot of whining, uh, <laughs> things that didn't work out. Uh, maybe we should focus on practices and stuff, uh, and 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 uh, focus on on stuff that are more of the interest of the South. I'm about war, explicitly. I mean, when we read about war, we read about the major wars, right? Uh, major wars. Uh, usually involve great powers and hardly involve the South in any case. So instead of going through Thucydides and Clausewitz, et cetera, um, perhaps we should, you, I mean, it's not we, you're right. <laughs> uh, we should talk about uh, the wars of liberation. I mean, the wars of independence, the wars of uh, the anti-colonial wars, the anti-imperialist mm. wars, and the participation of uh, uh, colonial uh, dominions in uh, the First World War and and the Second World War, and how this was seen in their in their own uh, in their own uh, countries. I mean, in India there was a big debate, both in the first participation in the First and the Second War, right? And that ultimately led to to independence. So should we just, you know, start from a different, completely different uh, point? I mean, that's a, as a suggestion. Otherwise, I don't see how we can say anything different <laughs> about war, really, if we don't focus on the conflicts uh, that have to do with the, uh, especially anti-imperialist, anti-colonial wars, which people don't talk about, really. I mean, when, I mean they're nowhere to be seen, at, at least only marginally. And that's where most people died in the 20th century, right? Uh, in those wars, in the Third World. So that's uh, one comment. I don't know if that's that's pertinent. Um, Arlene, um, diff very difficult foreign policy, uh, especially if, if there to think about the foreign policy for the Third World in common. Um, very close to. Ideology, that's one concern. Um, because in practice, if you look at NAM, if you look at NIO, if you look at uh, the ideas of dependency theory, I mean, empirically, uh, their influence on actual foreign policy of, uh, well, many states is minimal, really. I mean, it's important in intellectual debates. I speak about Brazil, for instance. Zero, I mean, not, not there. And I can, it's probably the same in many other countries. So we can talk about these ideas, very nice, etc. cetera. But uh, ultimately, states and foreign policy seek dis different goals. So we can distinguish the goals, but the, the actual foreign policy making, is it, is it any different? And then if we're talking about states, that's that's the trap. If you talk about states, well, yeah, autonomy. All states seek autonomy, uh, one way or the other. Um, the weakest more because they need it more. But, you know, Waltz would say the same thing. Sovereignty is autonomy. Krasner would say sovereignty is autonomy. So, yeah, there is a specific experience. Yeah, if you could explore the experience historically, yeah, that's that's interesting. But as an idea... It's not really original. So difficult. Foreign policy, I think, is true. Maybe, I don't know, foreign policy has to the production of identities. But then, uh, then that would be a different story. Uh, about order, well, uh, I think it, it's important to think uh, the thing about the Gramscian thing is that you think about on the framework of hegemony. So, and then you think uh, on the basis of intentionalities, right? Um, I think more and more of order as uh, unintended consequences, especially the liberal order. Uh, and that allows you to think about, about rule and domination more easily because otherwise you fall into imperial 
or some kind of definition of empire. And I think that's, that's not what we're talking about when you, when you speak of order, at least in the, in the modern state system. Um, so I would, I, w I would go thinking about order more as, uh, yeah, a liberal construct where uh, much about like, like Nick Onof does, I mean, where the unintended consequence is the rule by uh, the most powerful. But that's because, well, there is a struggle for rules. And then the unintended consequence is rule. And that this brings us to the uh, intermediate powers, right? I mean, they do struggle for rules. And I, since you disagree with me, I have to respond. Uh, 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 my point was not that, um, that the, the, the BRICS or the intermediate powers want to join the liberal order. No, I just think they want what every other power wants. Um, they, they're not doing anything different that other states haven't done in any other period, his, period of history of states. Uh, so they're contributing to the project of modernization and to the sovereignty narrative. You know, it's, I mean, they're not questioning that. On the contrary, as you said, they are actually defending the, principle, the rule of sovereignty because if the rule of sovereignty uh, survives, well, they have more of a chance of ruling the system uh, with the other powers. The revisionists are the liberals who are questioning the rule of sovereignty, right? So the BRICs are the conservative here. They, the status quo, they want sovereignty to stick. Um, yeah, these are my comments. About R2P, I'm also surprised that in any way uh, I don't. I, I, can you really th say that Deng is an African thinker? I mean, he, who wasn't he? Uh, Francis Deng. I mean, he uh. was in Canada all the time. I mean, he's <laughs> he's there with the Canadians, um, and the Africans are not very happy about R2P being only about Africa, right? I think it's mm. plain imperialism. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, thanks. Okay, we have two more questions, Christina, and then. One and then Ryan and then Ben, right? So okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, Christina here. So this is quite this question for everybody and so particularly. Um, how do we move from state centrism? Like, you know, I, I felt very uncomfortable, like with very straight state centric views. I don't know how to answer this on war. But perhaps on uh, foreign policy, something like how society has been trying to intervene in foreign policy and how the state has just captured. Because as Juan has said, the southern states they do, and southern economic elites, they just want the same as all the elites. And, like, they just want to reproduce all this power uh, inequalities and oh, they want to modernize, the modernization. So, uh, so I think about foreign policy in Brazil and how society has struggled to participate more in the process and has not succeeded, like local peoples, like the Amazonians and the indigenous peoples. Um, what is going on on a foreign policy that perhaps is interesting is like uh, subnational uh, policy, uh, subnational diplomacy, cities and states, uh, provinces trying to participate in foreign policy. That's something that's happening in the South as well. And uh, all these alliances between cities. And about order, perhaps something about bottom-up order constructions. And there are the documents of um, during the Rio Plus 20 and also Rio Plus 92. There are several civil society documents, indigenous people documents about how how order should be conceived or thought about. Because I think we, we cannot just focus on how China, we want a new order mm -hmm. or whatever, but perhaps how the locals in China or the locals in Brazil would like to see a new kind of economic order that's the, not the new, new uh, NEO order of the 1970s. You know, it's more, they are more inclusive, more, and it's a different kind of modern, it's not a modernization project, perhaps. That's my comment. Thank you. And um, back there, 
question for Arlene. And there's an industry of prescriptions. And those prescriptions are in form of uh, applied research from think tanks or policy recommendations by consultants. Um, you said that, of course, that uh, sort of knowledge that tries to end up in a translatable policy recommendation limits the sort of critique you want to deploy. It. And it seems that conventional and mainstream knowledge fits perfectly into that industry of prescription because it's the only one that produces the sort of prescriptions. If you want to be critical, and this is more for all of you, like in terms of your experience, how, how are you critical within that industry that demands prescriptions the whole time, that demands policy recommendations, that are think tanks that are deploying applied research and consultants that have to make policy recommendations to international organizations, ministries, presidency, and so on. Thank you. Thank you, and Ryan, and then Ben. Um, all right, so I saw a real continuity between the three chapters and even a progression that was very, very interesting. I was, my notes are very funny. They're like arrows going and then connecting and then pointing back at each other. Um, but it, I, I there's, so there's a few, so I'm gonna try to tie this all together. So it seemed basically that there was a conversation about sort of theorizing a non-state-centric pre-Westphalian system of, of like, of organizing the world, and that would be this new perspective on IR, this sort of, um, um, this Global South-centered perspective. Like, theoretically, like that was this idea that was thrown out a number of times. And that's really interesting, because to me, that implies like we're talking about an indigenous understanding of sovereignty. And w so what is that, what's the implication of that? To me, the implication of that would be, you know, what are the global needs? What are the things that people universally need? And then organizing a system around that. Suddenly it's not about state sovereignty, it's about human need, which is very interesting. Of course, like, what does that bring up as an American or, or as anybody with global movements happening right now, like, uh, that are all about um, reactions to neoliberal order, economic order, and just like a desire to fulfill basic needs. Um, so, in, in, I mean, it's, that has application in terms of the war conversation about like looking at war from the perspective of victims. Like I, I, compl I wrote that down and then it was said and I was like, That's, that seems um, like a very interesting exploration. And then in terms of American history, my favorite history book is The People's History of the United States, which is like, that is the goal of that book. Um, yeah, so I also was wondering about what would a kind of a post-racial, um, like humanist perspective of international relations look like? Like what, because it seems like that was the other implication, because it's like the another question that was like, seems core, is like wh what is the center? What is the defined normal? What is, what are we considering and then defining different? Is it, is it, North versus South? Is it like a sort of, um, is it gendered? Is it racialized? Is it w who's the central actor and who are the different? And that is capital the central actor? Like these seemed like questions that were implied under the surface, but not grappled with directly. And I think that there's a sort of like an overarching narrative for the book that would come out if you chose those as the central questions. So like those are, those are some ideas. Um, and I think, and then I'll just like see if there's one other thing, because I have a lot of notes. Um, um, right, just like this fundamental questioning of what is sovereignty and is there, how do you, how do you reorganize that idea and what, what, what does it say suddenly? Um, um, yeah, just a bunch of questions. Well, maybe you could yeah. email them to me and I can forward them. Sure. Yeah. Sure. No, no, that, I think those were the major things I wanted okay, to bring up. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. And then Ben Thanks in the back. Yeah, I'll be quick. Um, I just, so, so just to kind of respond, uh, so Karen, I think, uh, and it actually segues pretty good from, from the point you just made. Um, I think the, the, the problem I was trying to solve was what's, what's the universal human want that's at the core, what's the thing that everyone needs, and, and so maybe it's human security, maybe it's not military security. Um, and, and so I guess what I'm looking for, what I think 
we all kind of keep on getting trapped in is this cycle of um, we're all uh, products of a Western education system, and two of the three ideas here are concepts that come out of this Western system. So where are the where are the pre-Westphalian ideas that hopefully can kind of provide some new insights? And I think it's difficult because the voice of the West has been so loud, uh, but that's the one thing that I'd really sort of like to hear more of, of what, are the, what are the ideas that are coming out of these other places um, which can help to inform these ideas, even if it's in the context of the system that's, you know, political economic system that we have today. Um, so. Great. I'm going to let the um, panelists answer, but meanwhile, I'd like to say that tea, coffee and tea are ready for you. We're not going to stop formally because we want to continue. We want to end early, actually. So uh, please help yourself to coffee and tea and cookies. But meanwhile, please, uh, panelists, um, if you could respond to your comments and questions. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, go in the old, we'll go in the order presented, yes. Please leave some cookies for us. <laughs> um, sorry. Well, uh, first of all, Peter, thank you very much. Uh, the, the comments were very, very interesting, and I was taking note <laughs> uh, because I think that those are some of the ideas that I was uh, suggestions I was looking for. Uh, Tilly is definitely something that is missing in this uh, discussion. Um, I will not try to be, to be brief because I have several questions here. I think that the question about finance and war is definitely an issue that was mentioned by you too. So it's um, how to, to deal with the political economy of war and the justification of war from an economic point of view. I probably and definitely need to deal with that. Um, Navnita, structural violence, that for sure is a must. I don't know how I missed it, but uh, it will be in the last version. Um, gender is in the, the written version. I just, for 20 minutes, and Lily being strict, I had to go through the big axis. So gender is definitely in my uh, the written version of the chapter. Um, War from the perspective of the victims is, I think, one of the ideas that Peter mentioned and that I mentioned. I published a couple of years ago an article about the war on terror and its effect on refugees. And I think that that's definitely something that uh, this perspective, and you mentioned also this perspective of maybe the perspective of the South is the perspective of the victims of these wars. And maybe this is uh, how one way to solve this uh, uh, problem with which Arlene and Karen and I have been dealing with. Um, I think that I will definitely think about Jean's, uh, um, Jean's idea. Um, yeah, there is, for instance, uh, um, whole discussion about the use of chemical weapons in the war of the Rif uh, that uh, Spain and France waged against the resistance uh, in the northern part of Morocco against colonization. And this is completely absent from any discussion about uh, war and violence. So maybe instead, uh, this is something maybe we, we need to discuss it after we finish this meeting and we go to our more uh, specific meeting about the book. Maybe this is where I should start instead of having this literature review that exists in all the other te IR textbooks. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is the perspective I need to deal with. But definitely this, these are the, the issues that there are a lot of victims uh, of Moroccans participated in the First World War, they, in the Second World War, Brazilians participated in the Second World War, victims, a lot of victims. Uh, from these two countries, and I'm sure that they, these victims exist in many other countries. So, um, so I will stop here. But I'm certainly grateful for all the comments I got here and suggestions. Thank you. Um, I just want to add one additional comment about R2P, and I hope this doesn't sound like piling on, but. Um, when I, I worked for the International Commission on Intervention in State Sovereignty when they were writing the R2P report, and I remember talking with commissioners routinely, 
and um, how they identified themselves uh, wasn't necessarily, oh, I'm African or Latin American. Many of them used the term neo-Grotian because they went back to Grotius. Um, because Grotius writes about sovereignty under certain conditions can be forfeited, essentially. There's also a whole social movement in the 19th century um, of people who are trying to basically protect Christian minorities in what would now be present-day Lebanon. Um, they were trying to um, respond to atrocities. They referred to themselves as the atrocitarians. And so it was a very Western movement. Um, but there are those few uh, Western or non-Western things. But uh, I think some of the people have problematized that as sort of a almost a Trojan horse type thing because whenever they would talk about non-Western R2P, they would always mention those the three classic examples: India and Bangladesh in 1971, Tanzania and Uganda in 79, and Vietnam and um, Cambodia in 79. But if can you talk about sort of where those norms come from? Well. They couldn't really do that, so, um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to be very brief. Firstly, I'd just like to thank Jonathan a lot for his very, very useful comments. I think not just for me, but for the for the entire book project. I think they were really very, very helpful. And, and I think maybe we need to negotiate with him about borrowing his word adventitious to maybe use it in the book title. I think that would be, that would be great. Um, I just wanted to say, I mean, you know, I take all your comments on board, and but I've, I found especially the the distinction that you made between, you know, forcing me to decide what kind of critique I was doing. If is it an imminent critique, and if it is, then that really helps me to narrow my focus. So I think that that's very useful, and, and I think that's something that I'll have to decide and maybe discuss with my with my fellow authors. So thank you very much for that, um, Navnita. Again, thanks. I'll definitely uh, get back to you about those different sources. Um, Zhao, again, I think that that's a very useful um, idea to also think about um, not just order as being necessarily constructed, but as having perhaps unintended consequences. So I think that's something that I need to explore um, as well, and that'll open up different, um, I guess, opportunities for thinking about order, which perhaps will lead to Christina's point and the comment that was made at the back around kind of bottom-up order construction or ideas of construction. I think you called it indigenous ideas of world order. Um, so yeah, these are things that I will include, um, which means hopefully if I can cut some of the stuff that's in there that shouldn't be in there, there's more space to include some of this um, additional stuff. The R2P thing, um, the reason that I mention it, I think, is, um, it's interesting that it's, that it's uh, raised all this debate, um, is you know I was recently speaking to actually Amitav Acharya, who's writing a book about norms that people think originated in the West but didn't. And he is including a chapter on R2P, and so I, that may, I, that was the first I'd heard about it as well. So and then I found a, a special journal article of the Global Responsibility to Protect Journal from 2010 that was all about African views on R2P. So that's why I mentioned it. But yeah, I'm I'm not you know entirely familiar with the whole history of it, etc. But I thought it was interesting that. I think it just challenged the assumption that we just always think that oh yeah it was Canada that came up with the norm. Of course it was Canada. Well, maybe not. You know. So um, anyway, that's all I had to say. Thanks very much for your comments. Yeah, Arlene. Um, Christina, I think you're right that we have to look at subnational actors. Um, I've worked on city diplomacy. <laughs> Which is fun. I mean, this speaks to how conventional. I, I put on a conventional hat when I talk about foreign policy. Um, I think, especially city. Uh, I mean, this this would be an interesting way of going beyond um, at least the nation state and thinking about how other um, government, how, how how other how sub state actors um, may conduct foreign policy in a different way. And I think you could make the argument that cities. City governments perhaps are closer to citizens um, and have an easier time of articulating um, people's interests and demands. Um, so I, I think you're probably right. Um, and I think social, I, I have to, I'd like to think about what types of social actors to include um, that operate in, in terms of foreign policy outside of um, their relationship to governments. Um, 
I was thinking when you were speaking in Navnita of Clay Shirky's work, which is not, I mean, it's too optimistic for me, but um, his work on, you know, how social networks provide a venue for organizing and communicating. And I wonder if that could be translated into a reflection on foreign policy. Um, but I think, I think it's an important point. I think that this whole problem with the state is something that, that many of the chapters share. Um, what else did I want to say? I'm going to respond to Manuel in a second because it's sort of too hard of a question. Um, I don't think anyone was making the argument that we have to look only at pre-Westphalia. I, want, I wanted to make that clear. Um, that I'm talking, what, your name's Ben? Ryan. Uh, Ryan. <laughs> ben is in the back. Um, I think the problem is, is where we look. Um, one of the ways to think differently is to look before Westphalia. Um, but I think there's also many other ways to look at the world um, within Westphalia that we just don't tend to consider important for thinking about world politics simply because um, the existing order kind of puts blinders on us. I don't know if I'm explaining. So I, I didn't want you to get the wrong impression that I don't think any of us are saying that necessarily. The, the, the existing system tends to invisibilize other ways of thinking about. One of those ways is to go before Westphalia and see what there was. Um, other forms of political authority, other forms of social interaction. But, but I think there's also different ways of looking in the current order differently as well. Um, Manuel, who who's, um, was my assistant and is a good friend from Colombia, who's doing his PhD in public policy, asks an impossible question to ask. How to be critical in, in a context that demands applicability and functionality and um, practical knowledge? I don't think there's an answer, and I'm perhaps the best um, example. I, I do post, I, I consider myself post-positivist, but when I talk about foreign policy, um, I automatically shift into, uh, you know, a practical knowledge uh, mode. Um, I think it's a very difficult question. Um, I, I wanted to, to pick up on what Jonathan said about different ways of doing critique. I'm not sure that his idea of imminent critique um, would be the way to actually jump out of that applicable and practical mode. Um, I like the adventitious, you don't agree with me, obviously. Okay. <laughs> the adventitious um, mode is, is the way to, to, to actually break with that disciplining function of think tanks and you study public policy, that's probably a very difficult um, domain to, to break from. Um, but I think, um, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, I think one of the problems with, with applicability um, and this happens to critical theory as well, is that there's this obligation to speak to problems that exist today in the world instead of, as Wendy Brown says, putting uh, time out of sync with itself. Um, and so basically, um, I think the idea of, of, of seeking out um, critique from sources outside of those domains is, is how one has to go about the problem. And one way of doing this, um, at least is what I'm thinking about, is, is, is looking into alternative sources of knowledge about the problems that we study um, outside of academia, uh, outside of, of dominant spheres of, of social activity. Now, how you do this in a way that does not um, uh, subsume those ways of knowing and, and convert them into to, to, to knowledge useful for, for, domi you know, for, for relations of domination is something that I haven't quite worked through, but I think that's, that would be what I would answer. Um, and that's what I had to say. Thanks, thanks all of you. This is really amazing stuff. I'm so happy that you didn't just throw things at me. I was a little worried. Um, <laughs> We're in an alternative crowd, John. Yeah, I know, I know, but still I was thinking, okay, this is pretty IR. Um, no, I haven't um, written anything on this. I'm glad that you think it's worth, worth writing up. Um, I, I suppose I've tried to decenter IR in my own practice more so, which is, um, I've had the very good fortune to uh, have been asked to, to create an undergraduate global studies program here at the New School. And the people who asked me to create it asked me no idea what they were, <laughs> what they, what they were doing. Um, and, um, and I kind of decided to take seriously everything I'd learned in graduate school uh, because I had the good fortune to go to a place that, uh, at least at the time, <laughs> was, uh, was concerned with critiquing IR, um, and, uh, and think 
well, maybe we can do it differently. And so you know, when I heard you before saying, you know, don't start with 16, with Australia, start with colonialism, that's exactly what I do in my, in my intro class. We start with Totoro. Um, start with a Svetan Todorov and the conquest of America. And start with the question of encounter between self and other. And that as an organizing principle out of which all of these other things, including foreign policy, you know, emerges. But starting there allows you to see that as part of a larger problem of modernity um, rather than making it even more important than it, than it is or that it thinks it is. Um, and that's, I guess, part of the questioning of, or part of the, the challenge of decentering is you also have to strip things of their power and by doing so, you also lose some of your own power by association with them. And that's a little difficult on a personal level, too. I mean, I, I started, believe it or not, a long time ago in, um, in more of the um, more, I started in security studies. I did my dissertation on foreign policy and identity. Uh, and, um, and I had experience working for think tanks and government agencies and things like that. Um, not to do the kind of things I'm doing now means I'm not in discussion with them. There's a benefit and there's a cost. And the cost is that they're not paying any attention to me. Um, but the benefit is I feel extremely liberated <laughs> and, um, and can can really rethink what's going on here. Um, and looking at unexpected places has helped me a lot. Looking at literature, looking at other social sciences, looking at um, anthropology. Um, one of my sort of breakthrough moments was having the good fortune to study with an anthropologist named Michael Tausig. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. Um, and he would write about, he wrote things about this crazy search by, America, well, by Americans and Europeans who went to um, northern Latin America, to Colombia, Venezuela, to look the hunt and, and, to, and to, to Brazil, the hunt for the white Indian. There was this mythical white Indian. And there was this idea that, well, if only we could actually find this white Indian. Right? And, it's a, and this is a book called My Mesis and Alterity. And you know, through that, that, that real story, uh, he's able to bring out so much more about what I think IR is actually about than a lot of the other things that I have been reading that I, I found that a very interesting entry into that kind of, of thinking. So, um, so I applaud what you're all doing and, and I would urge you to be even more radical and, uh, and, and, and come up with you know, some way to, to really turn the, turn the tables on 